it's it's almost like a form of insanity, you know, you go after it with such fervor. We really want to know what happened and how things developed and, and we're interested in all sorts of aspects, not just the, the the piece of metal or wood or whatever that was a vessel, a sailing vessel, but the people that went and you know why they went. The War of the States raged, ravaging farm and factory, leaving the South as well as the North disassembled and struggling to reunite as well as recover. Casualties were catastrophic and sporadically reported. Battlefields are said to still be haunted by spirits of the fallen, their stories largely untold. By war's end, two fabled vessels surrounded in mystery lay quietly and undisturbed hundreds of feet below the turbulent surface of the Atlantic Ocean the slow sway of its floor further concealing their secrets. In response to the Confederates' decision to build an ironclad, the United States Congress authorized the Navy to uh, build three of them, all of them experimental, and the Monitor was the first of those to be completed, and it was of a radical new design. Uh, very flat, flat-bottomed hull, very low freeboard, with a turret, rotating turret with the guns, Initially, the Monitor was kind of this cockamamie, crazy concept of uh, a vessel that most people thought wouldn't even float. It's primarily metal, most of it's iron. There was a lot of skepticism about its seaworthiness. Uh, there was uh, even speculation that it would sink like a stone. But the ironclad USS Monitor, often referred to as a cheese box, became a model for shipbuilding, and in some ways changed the way battles were fought at sea. So it actually, uh prevented you know, the, the, the South or the Confederacy to move into the North. And I would say, you know, what they said at that time, the Monitor saved the Union. It became the prototype for more than 40 ironclads built on the Monitor design in the Union Navy, which played a major role in Union victory in the Civil War. If the Monitor at first appeared unstable, the Confederates, a few years later, launched a veritable death trap. The four-foot, three-inch hull of the H.L. Hunley didn't even allow its crew to stand. It was hand-cranked and designed to ram explosives into Union ships from below the water's surface. Here was something revolutionary that was the first submarine in the world to go out and sink an enemy ship and change for all times how war would be fought on the water. So she's almost a historical icon. Hunley also proved victorious in battle, but otherwise lethal. Both the Hunley and the Monitor were lost at sea, then hunted for more than a century. Both reflected the American revolution of commerce and industry. Both were the result of man's desperate determination to be victorious. And both exacted extraordinary bravery and patriotism from their crews. It's the story of a people who, in the pursuit of defense of liberty, have always been willing to put aside the element of fear and answer the call of duty. The call of duty sounded for naval warriors in the spring of 1861. Rather than leave her in enemy hands, Union forces burned and sank USS Merrimack at the Norfolk, Virginia Navy Yard. But Confederates, recognizing the usefulness of her hull, raised the ship and went about building an iron casemate. She was relaunched as the ironclad CSS Virginia. It was a man named John Erickson who engineered the Union's rebuttal. But for the most part, it's this big flat iron thing with a round gun turret on top. And most sailors were used to big wooden sailing vessels, the big glorious ships that you see with multiple masts and 40 cannons. This was completely different. Two guns, steam powered, hot, sweaty, coal driven. Um, and it's not something that men were just leaping at the opportunity to serve aboard. They were sort of written off by some of their friends and family uh, for having volunteered in this iron coffin, as it was called at the time. All previous ships had, had guns in broadside and deck guns, pivot guns, but the turret could fire in any direction. Two guns, one could fire while the other was reloaded, moved back and forth on carriages inside the turret, which was covered in eight inches of iron plating. Crew members looked out through small holes in the armor. It wasn't pretty, but turns out it worked. In March of 1862 at Hampton Roads, Virginia, the ironclad CSS Virginia attacked two Union ships, USS Cumberland and USS Congress, sinking them both. Union frigate USS Minnesota ran aground, but the Virginia was unable to finish her off before daylight's end. 
And when the Virginia steamed out the next morning, uh, it saw the monitor right next to the USS Minnesota to protect it. The Confederates couldn't believe their eyes. They thought it was uh, a boiler on a raft to be taken in to, uh, for repair. Uh, when the uh, boiler ran out of gun and fired on them, and that led to four hours of combat between the Virginia and the Monitor. So this was that, that one chance where here they are, these two top secret weapons, the same bay, the same battle, and they duped it out for four hours. And so for four hours, basically point blank rage, firing away, pounding each other, cannonball dense, armor, just an incredible battle, smoke, noise. The battle was essentially a draw, both ships returning with little damage. But the Monitor had really won the tactical victory because its mission was to protect the rest of the Union fleet there and it accomplished that mission. After the Battle of Hampton Roads, in which the, the capabilities of the vessel you know, were proved and it was proven to be a great technology, that's when there was a cachet of, hey, I'm, I served aboard the Monitor. Or, you know, so the, the Lincoln came and visited the vessel. He actually walked on board. And the crew, they seem to have a little bit of swagger about them. They maybe still don't necessarily like serving on that vessel, but because it's the Monitor, because it participated in this famous battle, they were kind of viewed as celebrities. Two years later, Charleston was under siege. The city had almost not a window pane left. Shelling's almost nightly. Undersea warfare was something people had talked about. There had been submarines that had functioned one fashion or another, and that had gone on for a long, long time. But finally, here comes a little submarine, eight guys cranking it, one guy kind of po poking his head out of the porthole. The H.L. Hunley was a privateer built in Mobile, Alabama, and sent via train to Charleston. The builders, including Horace Hunley himself, drew the attention of General P.T. Beauregard, who was leading the defense of Charleston. The propulsion system was a uh, hand crank. There were seven crank positions inside the submarine. Um, the crew would sit all on one side, on the port side. Uh, there was a ballast system, forward and aft. Between the two conning towers or hatches, you had a crew compartment. Uh, separating the crew compartment from the bow and the stern were bulkheads. They had dive planes on either side to, uh, to pitch the submarine up and down. And then if they wanted to come back to the surface, they could pump the water out of the ballast tanks with two hand pumps. Story is they would go get about $50,000 for every federal vessel that they could sink. Fort Sumter was under attack and Charleston was falling. General Beauregard seized the submarine and manned it with his own inexperienced crew. While boarding or unboarding, one of them steps down on the dive lever. The sub rotates, takes six down, five die. But having realized the error of his ways, he pleads with Captain Hunley, the chief financier, to come take the submarine back crew it with volunteers. You do it. The sub was raised, a new crew trained. Hunley himself was in the captain's chair, but without his first captain, whose job it was to light a candle, the only source of light inside the long iron tube. The boat dives into the depths of the Cooper River. It becomes pitch black in there. He can't find the seacock to turn off the front hatch. Water's flowing in. The boat becomes nose heavy, gets stuck in the bottom of the Cooper River in 32 feet of water. There, they, half of them suffocate, half drown. The first two crews in practice, they would go out, practice, come in, practice, practice, and then a crew would die. And they would haul the Hunley back up to the surface, get the guys out, and it may or may not be true, but stories of having to cut the bodies apart to get them out. In fact, the bodies of the first crew were found 133 years later in an old Mariner's cemetery, now a football field, Two graves had multiple body parts inside. One grave contained just one set of remains. One was a, was a, a Confederate sailor of color, and the color of his skin, they didn't get the body parts mixed up. They did with the other ones. For three weeks in October of 1863, the Hunley rested on the bottom of the river, Beauregard unwilling to devote more men or money to what had twice become a tomb. Now enters Lieutenant George Dixon, a young man who's seen the submarine, knows Captain Hunley, comes to General Beauregard and says, please let me have the submarine. That battle told us that from that day forward, the wooden walls, the wooden navies of the past were the past. If you wanted to stay competitive, you would have to build ironclads. Once the Monitor 
proved its, uh, its success, they were looked upon as, uh, as heroes. Officers' quarters aboard the Monitor were surprisingly luxurious, and there was a daily mail call. Dear Anna, and I thought we could continue our chat with pen, ink, and paper. The odd little ship's routines were chronicled by cruise letters to their wives. Lunch at 12, of whiskey and crackers, which I don't partake, but I'm sorry to say, all the rest do. Supper at 6, which is usually bread and butter, dried beef, cheese, crackers, coffee, and tea. On Christmas Eve, 1862, the Monitor received orders to head to Beaufort, South Carolina, then possibly to Charleston. It was never designed to be a, a deep water, uh, blue water sailing vessel. It was designed to fight in, in the coastal areas, uh, you know, the littor what we call the littoral zone today, rivers and, and bays and harbors. Um, and was designed to be towed from place to place. As the year 1862 wound to a close, the crew aboard the now somewhat famous Monitor, under tow by USS Rhode Island, was in grand spirits. Even as bad weather forced them below, they cheered uproariously as their ship became the first ironclad to round Cape Hatteras. The storm worsened. Waves crashed against the turret, causing it to vibrate and leak. As evening wore on, the storm's thrashing finally snapped one of the housers, causing the flat, top-heavy vessel to roll wildly. Greenville Weeks, the Surgeon General aboard, later shared his account. Solid iron from keels on the turret top, clinging to anything for safety. If the monitor should go down, would only ensure a share in her fate. Water began overwhelming the Worthington bilge pumps and dousing the fires which fueled the boat's engines. Ocean claimed our little vessel, and her trembling frame and failing fire proved she would soon answer his call. The Monitor's captain, John Bankhead, considered distress signals a last resort, but ordered the Red Lantern hoisted around 10 that night. The Rhode Island responded by sending lifeboats, but the treacherous sea overwhelmed them. It is madness to remain here longer. Let each man save himself. It was only then that Surgeon General Weeks made a desperate leap for a lifeboat, which now crashed about dangerously beside the sinking monitor. Just as he jumped, a swell seized the boat upwards and away. But Weeks was dragged aboard at Lieutenant Samuel Green's command. Aboard the Rhode Island, the doctor himself was treated for a dislocated shoulder and three smashed fingers were amputated. For an hour or more, we watched from the deck of the Rhode Island the lonely light upon the monitor's tour. A hundred times we thought it gone forever. A hundred times it reappeared, till at last, about two o'clock Wednesday morning, it sank and we saw it no more. People have said, well, was it a poor design? It was a great design, it just wasn't designed to sustain those type of, you know, sustain itself in those type of conditions. The real tragedy was that what enemy fire could not accomplish in the conflict with the Virginia and with other Confederate uh, ships and fortifications, Mother Nature did when it sank the Monitor in the last day of 1862. 47 men were rescued that night. 16 were either washed overboard or trapped inside the ship. Our little vessel was lost, and we, who in months gone by had learned to love her, felt a strange pang go through us as we remembered that never more might we tread on her deck or gather in her little cabin at evening. It would be 111 years before any human detected signal or sign of the USS Monitor again. Not once, not twice. Three times, people from all over the world came to Charleston to lift the siege on a city that was longer than the siege on um, Stalingrad and Leningrad in World War II. And they did so really to, fulfilling what the great book says is the greatest gift that any one of us can give. Why would somebody volunteer to climb into the Hunley, you know, to get down there, contort their, their bodies to get into this little metal tube with no lights and no source of, um, you know, no source of air to breathe, no, nothing to breathe. Once they hatch that, you know, batten down the hatch on that thing, you're down to a very short period of time that you can sustain life. Twice, the H.L. Hunley had plummeted to the ocean floor, killing its crew. 
Lieutenant George Dixon convinced Beauregard the sinkings were not the result of poor design, but of clumsy operation. George Dixon came back and said, no, give us one more chance, one more chance. I'll get a third crew together. Now, who are these crazy guys I to get in this get death machine, right? Guys to get in there. That is fascinating. None of them are from Charleston. None of them are from even South Carolina. Four of them are from you know, Alabama, Florida, Virginia, North Carolina. But then we have another four crewmen who uh, were immigrants. The crew of the Hunley is a really interesting cross-section of American society at the time. Uh, half the crew on board the Hunley are speaking with, you know, accents, other than southern accents, you know. <laughs> the purpose of the submarine w was, again, to dive beneath a, a target ship, and so they were intending to dive, but they weren't intending to dive deep or for very long. The goal really was just to get underneath the surface of the water and gut get underneath the ship that they were attacking. Dixon, by most accounts a flamboyant ladies' man who had previously served in the Confederate infantry, would captain the sub. He was the one who would navigate the submarine. He had a, a depth gauge, a compass. Uh, he controlled the valves for the forward ballast tank to let water in. Uh, he controlled the dive planes, and he was the only one that, could, that would be um, looking out the viewing ports um, and guiding the submarine toward this target. So, um, basically, they would, they would line up on a target, move forward, and then dive underneath it. It's not known exactly how the detonation system worked, but essentially, a torpedo-type explosive was mounted at the end of a spar which projected from the bow. The idea was to ram the spar into the enemy ship below its waterline. She's a great piece of technology. She bumped up on the technological limits of the day. She's 50 years ahead of her time in hydrodynamic design. She's got an air system, the world's first joystick steering. She's got a crew compartment that uh, had a three to one gear ratio. It's got skylights not known to exist uh, at that time. Confederate naval forces were growing ever more desperate to break the Union's blockade of the Charleston Harbor. Dixon and his crew made the 1,240-ton USS Housatonic their target. The sloop carried 12 cannons and a crew of 150. Under cover of darkness, the Hunley slipped low into the water at the breach inlet, moving out around the Housatonic, which was moored bound north. Conning tower exposed, Dixon maneuvered the sub to aim for the ship's starboard aft, then submerged to plan its lethal blow. And it worked to great effect. Uh, the Houstonic sank within minutes. Five Union sailors were killed, but many survived in the shallow waters by clinging to rigging. Accounts from those survivors vary. Some reporting the Hunley was hit by small arms fire before they submerged. Others report seeing the Hunley surface after the attack, signaling shore of their success with a white or blue light. We don't know exactly what happened, but the Hunley never came back. We want to fill the, complete that story. We want to tell all the aspects. Uh, and everything that we can discover about the Hunley and what happened that fateful night, February 17, 1864. The Hunley uh, was something that, that kind of mystified people. It was it's something like, you know, people wanted to find the Titanic. People wanted to find the, the Hunley. At one point, we got a very strong magnetometer hit. Clyde Smith went along on several search expeditions run and financed by author Clive Cussler in the early 90s. We had four square miles, Housatonic at the very middle, and what we just ran up and down across these one mile squares. And we were running lanes, if you will, like mowing the lawn. The mag hit was significant enough to launch divers. Smith went down to help stake out their find. We had five foot long metal rods that were, that could be screwed together. So we would go in there and we would pound these into the sand and then we'd screw another rod and pound that in the sand thing. And we ended up with an elliptical shape pattern of all these little rods sticking up that was the length we were looking for, 34, 35 feet or something. And it was sort of a cigar, a cigar shaped pattern. They uncovered a corner of the metal object, but determined that the sort of rivet they exposed belonged to a sunken buoy. They abandoned the site. Years later, Cussler returned and dug a little deeper. And they, they dug out some more, and that time they found one of the hatches. And that's when we knew it was the Hunley. When it was time to find it, it, got, it was found. So, you know, that's how that worked. And I said, you know, we ought to go get that submarine. We sent a site assessment out to take a look and see, do we have a rusted hulk? Is it gone on the bottom? We don't know anything. 
anything about its construction. All the records are gone and everything. But we could see through the viewing ports that the entire inside of the submarine was full of sediment. So we knew we were going to have preservation of the material that we would find inside. For example, the crew's remains were entombed in mud inside an iron coffin, which was then buried. They said an anaerobic environment had set up inside an oxygenless environment very early in the history of the vessel. And so they warned us that we could encounter skin, hair, and flesh in the recovery. Suspecting how well preserved the contents of the sub likely were didn't make the recovery any easier. In fact, it made it all the more delicate. It took several years for engineers to come up with a way to move the vessel without liquefying what lay inside. We have only one chance to do this and to do it right. Suction pilings were used to create a foundation which supported slings cocooning the vessel in the same starboard leaning position in which it was found. We knew we had one design weakness and that was that the four legs of that superstructure had to hit a moving barge at one time or two G's would go through it and damage everything. So they were holding the submarine up there over that moving barge and what we did is we created a 28 second window of smooth water with a dredge barge and as that traveled under that moving barge and that thing stabilized, that crane operator had to pop it and drop it on there with all four. And I'll never forget that loud, loud thump. And then we knew we had them. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it was like this incredible you know, thing that finally, after all these years, well over a hundred years, and here it comes out of the water. It was a wonderful day because it was about four miles in to Charleston's harbor. And when we got near the harbor and came down the jetties, uh, the Catholic Church, Stella Maris, on Solomon's Island began ringing its bell. And then the other churches in the city started ringing their bells. And on rooftops, there were hundreds of boats going by us. The rooftops across Charleston, the people on the roofs and everything, on the battery, they were at the aquarium, they were all over the Yorktown. The traffic came to a halt on the big cooper of the bridge and people are looking over the sides. And it's as though just time stood still for the Hunley to complete the final journey home. The first time I saw it was, uh, it was pretty incredible. So seeing this thing and knowing what it was and knowing how historically significant it was is pretty overwhelming. The wreck of the USS Monitor was elusive. Many teams searched, but it wasn't until August of 1973 that scientists aboard Duke University's research vessel Eastward finally found her. At the time, they relied upon grainy black and white photos taken with a submerged camera to confirm their find. At some point, the turret became dislodged and was lying underneath the ship, half covered by the ship and half outside of the ship. Um, uh, and again, with the ship totally inverted. It was a weird thing. The, uh, you know, the turret, as it was on the seabed, it was exposed and it's just, you know, it's just a, it just looks like a cheese box. It's just a cylinder. Uh, and it was open on top and, and the, you know, it had been dug out somewhat. You could see the, and of course, it's all upside down. So you see the bottom of the gun carriages and you see some, some of the support structure. And you'd swim up to it and you'd kind of peer over the edge. And if you had to do work inside of it, sometimes you kind of remove your fins and get in there and brace yourself. It was very small uh, with all the, the beams and things. And we usually would have a team between like six to eight people uh, that would be on the bottom and each one of them would be in, in buddy pairs and they would have a specific task. So uh, a lot of times those were either recovering small artifacts or recording features on the wreck or doing uh, photo and video of, of particular areas so that we could know where things came from and reconstruct. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest 
One of the most important things of removing artifacts is understanding where they came from on the wreck because they, they lose a lot of meaning unless you know exactly where they were located. The, the hard crust that tends to form on the outside, a lot of these big iron objects, it's called concretion. Well, we call it concretion. It's, um, it's basically hard like concrete, but it's a mix of, of sand and shell and coral and marine life and calcium. It's kind of a, a byproduct of some corrosion that forms on the artifact. How do you know it's an artifact? Like how, what can you, how do you recognize things? Yeah, so it, it is, it's really tricky uh, to sort of develop an eye for what you're looking at because, you know, if you take something like, uh, like a lantern, right, it has a number of different components in it. It might have glass, it might have, you know, some iron, and then it has a brass handle or something like that. So the parts that are iron typically have this concretion on them, so they just look like these bulgy, amorphous things that loosely look like the base of a lantern. Down two! Red dog, we're going to your back! The Navy has notified us on our way out one morning that there were suspected remains and uh, we went down and dove on the site and, and there, clear as day, uh, was one set of human remains. As you realize what it is, you're like, wow, that is unmistakable. And it is, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it wasn't a, a morbid thing. It was just, a, it was really profound to think this is, this is a, you know, it just makes the whole story seem so much more real. It makes these things come to life um, even though it's, you know, the antithesis of. No one had seen these individuals for, at that time it was about 140 years, and here we are, 140 years later, laying eyes on, on these guys again for the first time. And it was that, that was the point that we decided to cease all uh, uh, further excavation and actually remove the turret. Archaeologists knew the turret was a virtual time capsule and recovery would have to be delicate. And because it was flipped upside down, it was in essence resting on its roof, which was never designed to carry weight. So how do you lift 200 tons of material without having it give way and spill the contents? The Navy's Mobile Diving and Salvage Unit, or MUDSU, was largely responsible for removing the overburden, including armored plating designed to protect the monitor from cannon fire. Once that was out of the way, Mudsu used this specially designed spider to lift the turret. And then the excavation was continued on the surface once uh, it was out of the water. We can see kind of a, a commotion and a hectic situation based upon the artifacts. Um, of the two sets of human remains that were discovered in the gun turret, one of those sailors was wearing two different shoes. It's dark in there, the ship's pitching you know, side to side. Did he just grab the nearest shoes that were there, not even realizing in the dark, put them on and, and hustled up through the gun turret? We don't know. And when you have 10 to 15 foot seas splashing over the deck of the ship, you're not gonna open the deck hatch. So the only way up and out of the ship that night of the sinking was through the gun turret. Other artifacts found inside the turret suggest crew members were attempting to bring along some of their valuables. Perhaps it was, okay, I've got this chest with my items, I'm bringing it up through the turret, and by the time I pop my head out and look at the conditions, forget it, I'm, le I'm not taking these things, they're too heavy, they may pull me down. We have personal items from the sailors who served and died aboard. Silverware with inscriptions, clothing, buttons, boots and shoes, pocket knives, co everyday contents that these sailors would have had aboard the night of the sinking when you are actually able to discover something that has a sailor's initials engraved on it, and then you can go back through the crew list and actually determine who was the owner of that item, that's, that's taking the experience to a whole different level. One piece of silverware, a spoon, was inscribed with the initials JN for Jacob Nicholas. It's possible that one set of those recovered remains were his. He was 16 enlisted. Um, didn't want to go on the monitor, but all of his crewmates basically, you know, did, so he didn't want to be the guy that didn't, so he went aboard. Jamie Nicholas is a descendant of Jacob's. He's been able to read a series of letters exchanged between Jacob and his father in 1862. His father sent him a pack, Christmas package, and the next father is asked her kind of what he wanted. Um, the following letter, he told his father not to send it yet because uh, they were ordered to take the ship out into the ocean and come into a different bay. Um, and they didn't think it was seaworthy whatsoever. They, they had all their, you know, doubts, and uh, there was a lot of praying going and everything, and uh, so that's the last that we heard from him. Forensic scientists were able to reconstruct the faces from the skulls of those remains. One of the sailors was younger, you know, 17 to 24, 25. One of them was a little bit older, probably late 20s or 30s. Um, the older sailor had a 
tooth that was slightly carved out from, from smoking a pipe just from wear on it. You know, our nose, our chin and stuff, I mean, I can just see it in this guy right here, but I'm not, I don't know who's who on this picture. I'd love to know. I, I would say this guy right here really looks like him. The rotating gun turret, that remarkable 120-ton piece of 1860s engineering, is here in Newport News, Virginia, immersed in a 90,000-gallon tank. The turret, along with the steam engine, the cannons, and the carriages, are being conserved, that is, stabilized, enough to eventually be put on display at the Mariner's Museum. And our primary job here is to actually remove all of the salts that have accumulated inside of these artifacts. If we don't, if we were to say take a cannon, rinse it off, and place it on display, all those salts that are in there are going to react with the relative humidity in the room. Um, if somebody were to walk up and touch the gun, there's salts and oils and things on their hands. Over time, those guns would fall apart. They would break into pieces. They would corrode on display. Not an option. Archaeologists are occasionally able to get a better look at the turret when the tank is occasionally drained. We know that some of the sailors actually received concussions in the gun turret during the Battle of Hampton Roads. When we go back in and excavate the sediment, we were actually able to locate dents from the cannonballs from the, from the other vessels that actually pushed the armor in and uh, potentially with the locations where those sailors were standing when they received their concussions. They also found dents where the gun carriages slammed into the back of the turret and three small holes through which they could look out at their target. Many of the items recovered prove the monitor was a sign of the Industrial Revolution about to unfold. Most people think Civil War, long time ago, fairly crude, but what we're learning is that the incredible mechanical abilities of the, of, of the, of the nation in order to produce these machines and um, the industrial capacity, people producing these pieces in different areas, shipping them to New York. Um, they were all incorporated into the monitor. So it's, it's man in its struggle, but it's also a crazy machine. It's this really interesting hybrid. Remember the Worthington pumps that struggled so mightily the night the monitor went down? That's one of them. This is um, a steam engine, actually the steam piston chamber from one of the two bilge pumps. And as you can see, it's really cracked and fragile. And so what I'm doing right now is one of the first stages is to pacify the surface, put a protective coating on, and that's why you can kind of see it's gone black. The ultimate goal is to keep moisture from entering the surface of the object. So once the object's stable, structurally, physically stable, we then go back in and try to reassemble it, putting back all the small pieces. And so with objects of this size, you have to kind of do it in sections so that you can move it around. Imagine it's like a 3D jigsaw puzzle, trying to figure out where all these small fragments go, and the ultimate goal is to then reposition them in their fitting place. We can tell from the surface texture it was sand cast. We can see the parting line that runs down the whole middle of the mold. And so that's just one little story about, well, how did they do it? How did they make these things? And not only does it talk about the work of the foundry that made this, but it adds to the bigger picture of sort of that, you know, America's move from, you know, the farm to the, to the city, to the industry. There's all those little facets that, that we can tell and, and share with the public. To me, that's why it's important to save something like the monitor. Yes, it sank. Sure, it fought in a battle. It was only afloat for nine months. What's the big deal? Well, not only does it tell about the sailors who served, it tells us about life at the time, how people lived, how they died, um, and it's a benchmark for the country. And Here where was been. something revolutionary that supposedly, according to the, the history books, was the first submarine in the world to go out and sink an enemy ship and change for all times how war would be fought on the water. So she's almost a historical icon. The Hunley ended her celebrated journey from the ocean floor here at the Warren Lash Conservation Center in Charleston, South Carolina. She was immediately immersed in a 55,000 gallon treatment tank. First, a scan was made of the entire submarine, which gave archaeologists a two-scale rendering, helping them determine the best manner of access. Initially, they worked through an existing hole in one of the ballast tanks. Eventually, they pulled off the hull plates, essentially the lid on their sunken treasure chest. So we had no idea when we popped the hull plates to get inside and begin the excavation, we had no idea uh, what we were going to find. Yeah. You know, you, you come in 8 in the morning ready to work, you're going to start excavating mud. Not a clue, and there's nobody on earth that can tell you what you might find. Not living, at least. 
Delicately scraping through layers of sediment, archaeologists gradually revealed fascinating artifacts, beginning with the bench the crew sat on and dozens of buttons. We had a wide assortment of buttons, plain buttons for their clothing and um, whatever uniforms they happen to have with them. We had uh, Confederate Navy, uh, Union Navy, infantry, artillery, so a wide assortment of buttons. There wasn't a uniform for the Hunley, it's just whatever branch of, this, of military service they had already been serving in, uh, they had their, uh, their, uh, their uniforms from that. About two months into the excavation, the first human remains were discovered. What followed was amazing and critical to solving the mystery. Is a crew so well preserved in their bone structure, their brains are still in their heads. We spent a lot of time and uh, tried our best to be as accurate as possible with the mapping and recording of all of the, the bones, every single bone from each crew member. After the excavation, we took all the long bones, basically everything except for the hands and the feet, were scanned with a laser scanner. And then we made a, a reduced but one-to-one -one scale accurate 3D model of each bone and then brought it back uh, and lined them up with the points that we collected during the excavation. So you get a point there. Each crew member, a different color, dark and light. For example, the green means left and right sides. There's an entire spinal column that was articulated. Now obviously, and you can see the ribs still lined up. Nothing is attached anymore, but this man's torso ended up um, with his back down at the bottom of the submarine. The result, a depiction of where each crew member died. Each crewman's remains were pretty much, uh, had, they had decomposed at their stations. There wasn't a whole lot of commingling. There wasn't any evidence at all that these guys were fighting to get out. The more I looked at it, the more I realized it's almost impossible that these guys were conscious and drowning based on the disposition of their remains. Now, were they incapacitated by the explosion, um, knocked out, something like that? Uh, it's possible. Um, otherwise, we have to come up with another way for them to, to uh, die at their stations without any attempt to, to get out. It's possible they had become stuck in the mud and ran out of air. But remember, there are reports from survivors aboard the Housatonic that the submarine surfaced and signaled shore. What we're doing is, is compiling all the evidence, looking at all the clues and see what direction they point, what uh, theory of the sinking do they suggest. Do the same, we apply the same basic investigative techniques as detective work, crime scene investigators. We're doing the same thing, we're just doing it for extremely cold cases. <laughs> Captain George Dixon's story is the most chilling of cold cases. His remains were pretty well articulated. He was sitting in his seat almost like this with his hand back and he was embedded in the saddle. So we will go bring him out in what we call a block lift, which is with the sediment around him. Dixon, by some accounts, had a girlfriend by the name of Queenie Bennett back in Mobile, Alabama. The story went that she'd given him a gold coin when he went off to fight in the Confederate infantry in 1861. And he carried it with him at the Battle of Shiloh on April the 6th, 1862. He was shot in his left side, but the shot was deflected by that gold coin that was in his left pocket. But so far, the historical fable was thought by many to be nothing more than romantic fancy. Marie Jacobson was the archaeologist in charge of lifting Dixon out of the wreck. So Maria Jacobson got in there and slid in the mud and put her hands under his pelvic regions to make sure that we had him disengaged. When she did, she felt the cold ridge of the coin on his left side remains. I got it. Really? Say the word. I have the, the gold coin, no idea. You feel it in your fingers? Oh, I feel it in my fingers. Oh, I do. Oh, Could my God. Could be right. Uh, call James. Get James. Oh, my God. Oh, oh my man, God. I got chill bumps. On the coin is inscribed Shiloh, 1862. My life preserver, GED. When we pull the coin, the coin is warped, it's bent. The lead is still on Lady Liberty's bonnet where the shot struck. And when we looked at George Dixon's remains, he has the calcium deposits here on his bone where the coin was pushed into his flesh. 
In his right pocket, an 18 karat gold brooch embedded with 38 diamonds and a Kentucky Colonel ring bearing eight diamonds, one of them a full carat. This is Dixon's watch. Uh, the gold pocket watch was found well in his pant pockets. And on the fob, he has his name engraved and his Mason chapter. It says, George E. Dixon, model <coughs> chapter number 40. It wasn't that difficult to conserve gold because it's gold. So it doesn't corrode like uh, other materials, other metals will do. But we have the interior mechanism, and that was a big challenge because the mechanism, we have the porcelain dial, we have the iron hands, we have all interior brass and all kinds of metals. Components must each be treated differently, and textiles in this case, Dixon's clothing, are a particular challenge. The entire textile will be just draped on his body. The clothing was the consistency of toilet paper. Johanna painstakingly used water and syringes to remove sediment from the material. He was very fancy, as you know, so he was wearing cashmere. My problem in conserving him is that his uh, jacket and vest are both made of cashmere, and I think they're matching cashmere, so it's really hard for me to figure out what is what. These are drawings of Dixon's block lift as it was removed from the sub. They work as a sort of map as Joanna tries to put the captain's suit back together. Now this used to, used to be really red when I excavated, but light unfortunately affects a lot of the materials. The vest is beginning to take shape. This is the bottom line, and those two holes there was where the buttons were. Mm -hmm. so, and here, uh, this is the chest line, and it goes like this. We have that missing area over there. This is the neckline. That's where the arm goes. Remember the unlit candle in the second sinking of the Hunley? It appears this crew's only source of light was on board and intact. And it was completely covered in sediment. It was concreted. Some uh, part of the candle was fused to the hole, which is why we have this very dark orangey red type of material. That's removed the candle out of the holder. And unfortunately, I can't remove the wick. So this, this one is going to be treated in a way that is going to be safe both for the wig and for the wax. And also the candle was, wasn't really burned that much, so it was a little bit burned, but we will have traces of wax in the holder if it will have burned for a long time, but we don't. Okay. So it was barely used. Right, so it tells the story of they hadn't been down very long. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One of the most telling finds discovered in late 2012 was under a brittle layer of concretion at the end of the spar, remains of the copper sleeve used to attach the so-called torpedo. You can also see the, uh, the peel-back effect of that copper. Again, that's not from physical trauma, that's the force of a detonation. Uh, the shock wave of the explosion blew back the copper as the torpedo destroyed itself. And so since we have this remains on the end of the uh, spar, we're 100% sure that the torpedo was detonated uh, while still attached to the end of the spar. And that's a big clue for us. That means the detonation initially took place within 18 feet of the submarine, and the crew fully expected to survive the blast. The casing also confirms the explosive was an Edgar Singer design, which, according to historical drawings, contains 135 pounds of gunpowder and was detonated with a trigger mechanism. The crew is known to have conducted tests using half the charge, and the wooden hull of the Housatonic could have created more blowback. So doubling the size of your charge and placement could have possibly had some negative effects for the, the submarine hull or crew. We don't know. Keep in mind, though, there's been no damage found on the submarine caused by the explosion. Did they do, as some of the witnesses said, it backed up, disappeared into the dark after the explosion? Was it anchored out there? Did they throw that grapple hook out, and was the rope too short, and did it pull the Hunley under and trap it? And did they have anoxia and just boom, black out? We don't know yet, but we will know. Even after 150 years, the nation's commitment to bring you home is as good today as it was during the Civil War. It was pretty remarkable that they honored these guys in that way after such a long amount of time as elapsed.
On March 8, 2013, the 151st anniversary of the Battle of Hampton Roads, the remains of the two sailors recovered from USS Monitor were laid to rest. However, having raised those remains, we brought them here to the National Military Cemetery founded during the same great conflict for which they gave, in President Lincoln's words, their last full measure of devotion. It was kind of nice, though, to see it concluded. The site where about 80% of the Monitor wreck still lies is now a National Marine Sanctuary, another first. The remains of 14 other men may still be buried there. This is something that I can assure you the crew of the Monitor back in 1862 never would have imagined they'd be involved with. But in the end, that sacrifice and that contribution may be as, as equally as, as effective and powerful as, as what they did on March 9th uh, in helping us to, to be better citizens and uh, caretakers of the sea. Until 2011, the H.L. Hunley sat at the same 45 degree angle at which she landed on the ocean floor in 1864. Once the artifacts were recovered, she was rotated upright. She's undergoing preservation and archaeologists are figuring out how to safely put her on display. Her crew received a burial service in line with the crew who went before them. You could hear the clump of the horses and the soldiers passing by and the coffins. And it was like going back to the burial that was given to Horace Hunley. All three crew remains now lie at Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston. Meantime, archaeologists and historians continue their work solving the mystery of the H.L. Hunley. The Hunley is like a giant jigsaw puzzle, but she very jealously has held on to that last secret. <laughs>